Revelation chapter 2. We have already swooped through <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1. And I guarantee you we didn't get everything in there. Check my... Yeah, I think it's good. Revelation chapter 2. John has been introduced to Jesus. Can you imagine that? You're John. You, you traveled and walked with Jesus for three and a half years. You knew him well. You knew what he looked like. You knew, thought you knew everything about him. And then you see him depart into heaven. John was there. You see him depart in a cloud. Two angels standing there, the same Jesus, you know, will so come again in like manner. And then like 60 some odd years later, you're praying and you hear a voice like trumpets. And you turn around and there is the familiarity of Jesus, but he doesn't look like the Jesus that you saw 60 years ago. Has it been 60 years? You know, he's an old man. He's 90 some odd years old, uh, John is. And so he sees Jesus again after 60 years, probably wanting to embrace him, but just the, the way he looks, you just fall down on your face before him and uh, worship him and just don't know what to think. So he's giving you seven letters to write to the seven churches. And again, <clears throat> you know, some scholars like to take these seven letters and say, well, those seven churches belonged in those days back 2,000 years ago, and there's no direct relevance to us, which I don't believe. Some have taken the seven churches and divided the church age up into seven like dispensations with like the beginning church being the church at Ephesus because that's the first church that Jesus writes to. So supposedly you're supposed to be able to read what Jesus said to the church at Ephesus and see the early church from the book of Acts in here. Now I've read this multiple times. I don't see it. I just don't see it. Um, it's, to me, that's like a lot of things that people can do with scripture is jam a square peg into a round hole and say, see, it fits, doesn't it? Okay, but you got all these gaps and stuff doesn't work. Um, or you could see these seven churches the way we see the other churches that Paul wrote to Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, four letters we know of for sure that we have in the scriptures. Two of them are in the scriptures. The references to the other two are in the scriptures. Um, you have the, uh, the church at Corinth. You have the church at Thessalonica. You have the church at Ephesus. You have Paul's letters to Timothy. It, but was Paul's letter only to Timothy and nothing, and nothing else applies to us? No. The doctrines that are in these letters are timeless. They represent the way Christ wants his church. So Paul said, I think to the church at Colossae, he said, the letter that I wrote to Laodicea, have it read in your church and have this letter that I've written to you read at the church, to the church of Laodicea because the doctrine is the same. No matter what church you are and no matter when you are, the doctrine is the same. <clears throat> and especially this very beginning part here where the first thing that Jesus says to the church at Ephesus, let's look at it. Uh, and y'all pray for me. I am still very weak. Um, I had some pretty good energy earlier this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, let's see. Yeah. Tuesday was Lisa's surgery. Wednesday, I was kind of not doing so well. 
Thursday and Friday I was doing better. Yesterday I was out of it. Today, I'd be honest with you, I'd rather be in bed right now. But anyway, it's more needful for me and you to be here this morning. Amen. Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. What are those seven stars? Seven churches. You could also say the seven spirits of God, the seven seals. We are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise and so on. But anyway, which holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. His right hand, the right hand is always the hand of power. Uh, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. We looked at what that meant. The symbolism of it is that he is always in the midst of his people. Where two or three or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So he's in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And the menorah. The seven candlesticks from the Old Testament, from the Old Testament temple, we know the 66 decorations in on that spells out the Bible. So think of that. Think of Christ always being where? But where exactly? In the midst. In the midst. The four Gospels. He's right there in the midst of it. Okay. So, anyway, i got to find Revelation again. Anyway, that's where he is. He's right there in the midst of it. Uh, think of your DNA, the, where the four base pairs join together to write the, the genetics of our genetic code. That's the word, and he's right there in the midst of it. So here's what he says. Uh, these, uh, verse 2, I know thy works. Jesus says this about almost all of these churches. I know thy works. Okay? There's not anything about our church that Jesus doesn't know about. He is the shepherd of the church. There is a passage in the scriptures, I can't remember exactly where it was, but it tells the shepherd that he ought to know the state of his flocks, the condition of his church. Well, if he were to look at our church right now, yeah, doesn't seem like there's a lot of people here. There isn't. However, the condition of the church itself, if all of the people that were here, the last Sunday we had everybody here, are still Christ, he still holds them in his hand. Don't ever forget that, people. He still holds us in his hand. He says, I know thy works and thy labor, there are things that God will call us to do, things he will call us to perform, whether to pray, whether to study, whether to aid somebody. We had a guy that uh, got out of the hospital this morning, came by here needing a tank of gas. Um, so we gave him a tank of gas and sent him on his way. But I know John, I know John witnessed to him. And that's our works. That's what we do. I uh, talked to Michael this morning. We're going to start the process feeding people again next week. Okay? I told Michael, I said, as well, as long as we got the devil mad, let's just keep it going. Um, I, don't, I don't think we're supposed to stop. That's just my opinion. I, don't, I think God's blessed us. And... You say, well, where's the blessing? Where's everybody at? The devil's hit us. I know, but God still blessed us. We're still blessed. And so anyway, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. And now we get into a doctrinal issue. How, and by the way, how does patience come? Tribulation. Patience comes through tribulation. I made this point. And the Pastor Mike online that I recorded on Friday, I made that point, is that we ask for patience, especially in a one gigabit download world, where we, we want the movie from Netflix to download instantly, which you ought not have Netflix. Amen. Okay? Not with that pedophilia that they got on there. Okay? I had a subscription, I canceled it. As soon as I found out about it, boom, gone. And they're hurting over it. I read something the uh, day before yesterday. They were, they were projecting a million and a half new 
subscriptions. They only got 13,000, something like that, or 130,000 maybe. They're way, people are boycotting, and people, it does have an effect. And whether or not they ever take that off, I'm not going to pay, I'm not going to pay them to put that sleaze on there. They are, they can say what they want to about free speech. They are trying to sleaze up this country. Zero doubt in my mind about it. They are trying to sleaze up this country. Anyway, I know thy works, thy labor and thy patience, which comes from tribulation. It comes from the things that we've been through and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Amen. Take a stand in this world. Take a stand. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. Now, how do we know? Well, let's, let me ask it this way. How does Jesus know? Jesus has a reason for saying what he's saying. Apparently, some, some men came to that church or even some women nowadays came into that church and said they were apostles of Jesus Christ. Not epistles, that's a letter. Not disciples, we all are disciples. But they specifically use the word apostle. What does that word mean? Does anybody know? Let's start with the definition, the word apostle. Okay, this is a little bit of leftovers from my Greek schooling. Apo, the, the first three letters, A-P-O, means like away from or outside of something. Okay, So the, the literal definition of apostles is they were called out and separated. Okay, Paul mentioned the office of apostle. He said to the Holy Ghost, apostles to some prophets to some preachers to some teachers some evangelists and so on and so on so we know the holy ghost has to call somebody and those men were separated out from just like with the office of deacon when the issue came up and they needed uh, an office they needed men to fill an office they called seven men and they separated them out from the congregation they did prayer and fasting, they laid hands on them, they prayed over them and administered to them uh, through the laying on of hands, the office of deacon. And those men were set aside for that particular office. That was their job, that was their duty, and um, that was what they were called to do. Uh, we have two deacons here at this church. Both of them fulfilled their roles, I think, in my opinion, uh, in, an, in an admirable way. But both of these deacons are different. Brother Sterling is different than, than John. They do different things in the church, but they both are pillars of this particular church. And they are called out for that purpose. So the word apostle means called out. Now, how, how would we know? Let's say that somebody came in and said, uh, hello, Pastor Mike and Bethel Church. My name is John Smith, and actually I'm Apostle John Smith. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, and uh, I've come here to set some things straight in this church. How would we know that that John Smith, or, yeah, Joseph Smith, Joe Smith, how would we know that he's not an apostle? Are, do there, are there people right now who claim to be apostles? The Mormon church has 12 apostles currently that rule over the, Catholic, the, uh, the Mormon church. The Pope who sits in the chair of St. Peter believes in what's called apostolic succession. So after Francis the talking Pope dies, when he dies, uh, they will bring the guys wearing lacy dresses in. That ain't right. And they will need 77 votes. That's interesting because that was the mark on, um, who was it, Lamech? In, uh, Genesis, in Genesis 4, 3, yeah, 4. So anyway, how will we know 
that they're not really an apostle. There are, let me say this, there are men who call themselves apostles in Kenya. And I'm not going to be so mean and rough on that as I am the rest of them. Because there are some men in Kenya who are ordained ministers who see themselves as sort of overseers of a group of churches or overseers of pastors. Now, I don't get all uptight over that. I don't necessarily... You folks in Kenya, I'm, don't ever call me Apostle Mike. Don't ever do it. It's not my office, it's not my calling, and it's not my place. Um, all, I, all I have is a radio station and a big mouth. That's all I am, okay? But what we're going to do is we're going to find out from the Scriptures what makes an apostle and why there cannot be apostles right now, male or female, especially female, but male or female, there cannot be apostles in this age right now. When Jesus said to that church, thou hast tried them, meaning that they gave them the test of the apostles. They didn't match up. Tried them which say, say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars. How would they have known that? Jesus is now commending them. He's not condemning them because they accepted these men or he's not uh, chastising them or saying to them, don't do this as if they haven't done it yet. They've already found out that these guys are liars and Jesus is commending them for this. How did they know? that these guys were not really apostles, okay? Yes, the Bible, but where? Where in the Bible? Where would you go to find that out? Number one, you wouldn't go to the Old Testament because it's not there. It's a New Testament word, New Testament office. Where would we find out? First place, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. So let me ask a question. Who picked the apostles? Who picked them? Jesus did. And how did he do it? In each case, how did he do it? Including Paul. How did he do it in each and every case? Here's where I'm going. He did it face to face, personally. Personally. There was no cardinal, there is no office of cardinals in the Bible anyway. None. Okay, uh, they're called cardinal bishops. In other words, they are elevated bishops. Okay, they're the, and basically they, I don't know. But anyway, how, how is it that each one of them, each one of them were chosen personally? And it says that, Acts chapter 1, turn there. So the question is, are there still living apostles? Um, back years ago when we had a Christian school, we had a lady bring her daughter's to our school and I knew I had a feeling in my in my gut it was going to be trouble and it was this lady said that she went to a church where they believed that they still had apostles they were of apostolic they were apostolic Pentecostal and um, turns out that the mom and the girls were practicing witches and they were doing it here so anyway Acts chapter 1 verse 2 uh, the Bible says, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles, notice this, whom he had chosen. Whom he had chosen. So the Bible's given you, number one, the fact that Jesus chose these men personally. Face to face, one on one. Now verse 15. Now that Judas, including Judas, but Judas' office now is vacant as was prophesied all the way back a thousand years ago in the book of Psalms. And so in verse 15, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about a hundred and twenty. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, 
which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and, and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. And just for whatever, if you need the forensic idea, his body had hung on that rope for days until it literally rotted apart. That's what happened. And when it hit, you wouldn't want to have been standing there. Guarantee you. But anyway, um, verse 19, And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that the field is called in their proper tongue, Akeldama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. And his bishopric, his office, let another take. Wherefore of these men, notice now he's going to give their qualifications. Wherefore, which, in other words, which one of these men, which have, number one, companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Number, first qualification. They must have accompanied with the disciples or the other apostles the whole time Jesus was on this earth. Okay, first one. So, um, there is a prophet up in St. Louis, David, um, what's his last name? I can't remember his last name. Guy's a false prophet. He calls himself apostle now. So, apostle David is lying because he didn't accompany the other apostles when they were with Jesus. He's lying. Okay? Uh, number two. Uh, verse 22. Beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us. So that's the second qualification. Be um, then he said, Must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection... Third qualification, he witnessed the resurrection because Jesus, even though Peter and John saw the empty tomb, Jesus made an all of a sudden came through the wall appearance to the 11 disciples. Judas had already hung himself, showed himself. You remember that was the situation where Thomas was going, I don't believe it. I won't believe it unless I can put my finger in the holes in his hands and put my, thrust my hand into the, in the side that was pierced. And so Jesus said, here, stick your hand right in here, Thomas. And what did Thomas say? My Lord and my God. He believed, okay? Then it said, verse three, so that was the qualifications. And verse 23, and they appointed to Joseph called Bar Sabbas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. So out of the 120 that were there, two men qualified. Justice, even though we don't have in the four Gospels a mention of either Justice or Matthias, according to, the, according to Acts, they were there. They had followed with the disciples, the apostles. They saw... They were there when John baptized Jesus, which means they would have heard the voice and saw the Holy Spirit light on his shoulder. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. They would have heard that voice and then they would have saw him crucified. Then they would have seen him alive from the dead after the third day. They would have seen that Justice and Matthias were two men and apparently the only two who were qualified, but... Just as with the Old Testament. Notice that we have a sort of a parallel. How many tribes did God pick in the Old Testament? Twelve. Twelve sons. Okay. But then it wasn't just twelve though, was it? You have what was always called throughout the Old Testament, the half tribe of Manasseh. Half of what tribe? Where did Manasseh come from? Joseph. Joseph. So Joseph's tribe was actually divided in two, Ephraim and Manasseh. So 
Levi, when it came time to give out the land, Levi wasn't given an apportionment of land. And yet you still have 12 divisions of land. How so? The half tribe of Manasseh gets one and Ephraim gets the other. And they're both from Joseph. Okay, so you still have 12. God knows how to do the math better than we do. Amen. And that's, and I want you to think about it. When you look in the list of the 12 tribes in Revelation chapter 7, where they're sealed with the Holy Spirit, okay, sealed with the seal of God in the forehead, notice Dan is missing. If you read that list, Dan is missing. His name has been taken out, okay, and he's replaced with, you have uh, Joseph mentioned, which would be Ephraim, and you also have Manasseh mentioned. You still have 12. God took one out and replaced it with another. God did the same thing in the Old Testament. It's the same God. Amen. Amen? Same God. So now that's what they're doing. They took Judas out and there was 11 and there was confusion there. So now let's bring that 12th man in. Okay. And so here's how they did it. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and that lot, and the lot fell upon Matthias. Now, we don't know what casting lots is. We always have this picture of drawing straws, but that wasn't it. But it was some sort of, we would say, chance. But with God, there is no such thing. And so God used the lot, which God had, had God ever done that before? Had God ever used the lot to pick somebody before? Hmm? Yep, he did. Achan. When they went to find out who had stolen something out of Jericho that he was not supposed to take, they cast lots to find the tribe. They cast lots again to find the head of the tribe. They cast lots again to find the family. And then they cast lots to find Achan. So they're doing it here. And God the whole time is directing the lot to fulfill his word. So, uh, and they gave forth their lots Verse 26, and the lot fell upon Matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So, and I've heard various things that Matthias wasn't really an apostle and so on and so on. But the Bible says he was. So if the Bible says he was, it's good enough for me. Okay. But now what about Paul? Paul wasn't that we know of wasn't present although he might have been but he wasn't really present with the disciples when jesus was baptized he we don't see an indication that he was present when jesus died on the cross when he rose again on the third day but was paul's apostleship legitimate okay um, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Acts chapter two, verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, someone who says, I am an apostle. That means by its very nature that they can dictate to us what we must believe what it look at what happened they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine now here's something different with paul paul didn't learn during the three and a half years that jesus was here he didn't he wasn't taught the parables he wasn't taught any of those things he didn't learn from jesus but did paul learn from jesus yes he mentions that in the book of galatians that he, when he, after he was baptized and he received his sight, that he conferred not with flesh and blood, but separated himself out 
He went and saw Peter, but he didn't go to Peter and say, Peter, tell me the doctrines. Tell me what we're supposed to believe. He got away by himself, and I believe Jesus appeared to him personally, just as he did on the road to Damascus, and gave him the doctrine, showed him the mystery, showed him everything in the Old Testament, how it fulfills, it is fulfilled in the body of Christ and so on. So yes, he was both called by Jesus and he was taught personally by Jesus after his baptism. So someone who says they are an apostle, what that means is they get to choose, what time is it? Good grief, it's a quarter till. Yeah, I better quit. Anyway, um, we'll continue this next Sunday. I got, there's nobody to ring the bell, so. Yeah, ding, ding, all right. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll touch on this about the issue of apostles. And if somebody says they're an apostle, basically that means if we believe they're an apostle, we have to listen to what they tell us to believe. Which is why the Roman Catholic Church calls the supreme pontiff the apostolic successor to the chair of St. Peter. Because Peter had doctrine and they all had to listen to Peter. So now we all have to listen to Il Papa, and I'm not about to do it. Amen. Father, we love you, and we thank you, dear God, for the simplicity that is in Christ. Father, that no man brings confusion to us by calling himself an apostle. But, Father, we just simply believe what your word says. We thank you for your word. We ask you, dear God, to bless us in that word. And, Father, teach us the doctrine of the apostles. Teach it to us, Father. By way of your word, your precious word, we love you. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. amen.